What part of your body would you stick into an experimental machine for science, and would you do it for $25? Keep watching for the strange and painful history behind some pretty weird science. Dr. Robert J. White was obsessed with brains. A neurosurgeon operating out of Cleveland, his journey into scientific infamy started in the 1950s when a Russian scientist grafted the head of a dog onto the body of another dog, thereby creating a two-headed mutt. This understandably stirred up some debate in the science community, but White took it as a challenge. In 1965, he surgically attached six dog brains into the necks of living canines. He then removed a monkey's brain and kept it working for 12 hours outside of a body. And he wasn't finished there. In 1970, White took the head of a rhesus monkey and attached it to a headless primate body. While it was too difficult to fuse the spinal columns together, the brain was perfectly functional, and the animal could taste, see, and hear. According to varying accounts, White kept his hybrid creature alive for somewhere between three and nine days. Obviously, animal rights activists were infuriated with White's experiments, but he did pioneer new ways of preserving brains during surgery. Who are you? I'm your brother. You and I are now one dummy. If you're familiar with old sci-fi movies, you know it's a bad idea for scientists to play around with radioactivity, as they could threaten an entire community with an incredibly irresponsible experiment. That's exactly what happened in December 1949 at the Hanford site, a nuclear production complex in Washington state. Hanford was the plant that churned up enough plutonium to create Fat Boy, the atomic bomb dropped on Nagasaki. On December 2nd, scientists released iodine-131 into the air to see if the United States military could detect the presence of green fuel from a distance. You may be wondering what green fuel is. Well, it's not good. Normally, uranium fuel is cooled for about 100 days. That way, the radioactive iodine will fade away. But if you cool it for only 16 days, then it's still incredibly radioactive, or green. The American government worried that the Soviets were using green fuel to build their bombs faster, so they needed to know if their instruments could pick up on radioactive iodine. That way, they could determine if the Russians were taking the lead in the nuclear arms race. So the Hanford scientists were ordered to release iodine into the atmosphere as a test run, but unfortunately, they accidentally released between 7,000 and 12,000 curies of it. Again, that's not good. For perspective, the Three Mile Island nuclear power plant accident released only about 24 curies at most. Making matters worse, the weather was less than ideal on that December day, and the iodine spread over 200 miles. This accident contributed to Hanford becoming the most contaminated spot in the entire country. Edgewood Arsenal is an American Army facility near Chesapeake Bay in Maryland. According to the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs, from 1955 to 1975, this base was home to thousands of human guinea pigs. Edgewood Arsenal scientists can turn nature upside down. Somewhere between 5,000 and 7,000 men joined the Edgewood program, but even though they signed consent forms, they were never actually told what kind of experiments they were participating in. Upon arriving at Edgewood, they were assaulted with basically every chemical in existence. While a few lucky servicemen were given relatively mild drugs like caffeine, most didn't get off that easy. Some were sprayed with LSD, while others were given PCP or barbiturates. On one occasion, a group of soldiers were given BZ, a drug that causes agitation and hallucinations, and then put in a newly assembled outpost. They were then forced to deal with fictitious war scenarios the scientists watched on cameras. Most disturbingly, many soldiers were hit with deadly toxins like mustard gas, sarin, and VX. Many Edgewood veterans are reportedly still suffering from physical and psychological trauma, including diseases like Parkinson's. From 1978 to 1996, Ted Kaczynski sent 16 explosive devices to universities, airports, and unsuspecting citizens across the country. Dubbed the Unabomber, he was a recluse who hated technology so much that he attempted to reverse the negative effects of the Industrial Revolution by killing three people and injuring 23 more. But how did he end up like that? We probably can't blame any one incident, but we also can't ignore what happened at Harvard University in 1959. When Kaczynski was a 17-year-old sophomore there, he signed up for a strange psychological experiment. He and 21 other students were asked to write down their most personal beliefs and opinions, and they were then going to discuss and debate their ideas with each other. Or so they thought. In reality, they were about to have their minds destroyed. The experiment was run by a man named Henry A. Murray, who had trained American spies to withstand interrogation. In his Harvard experiment, Kaczynski and the other students were strapped to chairs rigged with electrodes and blinded with bright lights. 
Then, they were forced to debate their beliefs with law students who were told to be as nasty and abusive as possible. After the test subjects were thoroughly humiliated, they were forced to watch recordings of the entire affair. This went on for three years. When Kaczynski was later connected to Harvard, the files related to the experiment were permanently sealed. In 1950, the U.S. military turned San Francisco into a bacterial testing ground as part of an experiment called Operation Sea Spray. With the Cold War looming, government officials wanted to know which cities were most susceptible to biological attacks. They also wanted to learn how far biological agents could travel through the air. For the experiment, they picked a microbe called Ceraceus marcescens that was supposedly harmless, with a red pigment that would make it easy to track. The Navy sailed a ship off the coast of San Francisco, spraying a giant bacterial cloud into the air. Blending into the fog, the cloud floated down streets and into buildings, and soon enough, average citizens were inhaling millions of germs. The Navy kept this up for six straight days and then determined how far the bacteria had traveled. This incredibly unethical experiment had some tragic results. The bacteria led to at least 11 urinary tract infections that were initially resistant to antibiotics, and one man died of heart complications due to that microbe. But that didn't bother the government. They ran tests in American cities over 239 times, and these experiments didn't stop until President Richard Nixon banned germ warfare in 1969. As for Operation Sea Spray, it didn't become public knowledge until 1976. In May 1955, the American government dropped 300,000 mosquitoes onto the state of Georgia, hoping to see how effective these bugs could be. Encouraged by the results of Operation Big Buzz, the government went on to drop even more mosquitoes on the South in Operation Dropkick, Operation Gridiron, and Operation Mayday. But those experiments were nothing compared to what happened in Illinois' Stateville Penitentiary. In the early days of World War II, U.S. officials wanted to develop drugs to fight malaria, but they needed to experiment on humans. That's how government officials ended up at the Illinois prison, offering to reduce sentences for any volunteers. It was a tempting offer, so over 400 inmates signed up to get bitten by 10 mosquitoes per day. They were also given anti-malarial drugs, some of which actually caused heart attacks. On top of that, inmates suffered from serious malarial fevers that hit up to 106 degrees. Shockingly, these experiments continued for 30 years. During the Nuremberg trials that were held in the wake of World War II, Nazi doctors justified their own experiments by pointing to Stateville. While that argument didn't help them out in the court, the American people eventually realized that conducting tests on inmates was a bad idea, and prison experiments stopped in the 1970s. The 1960s was an exciting time to be a scientist, with the space race leading to plenty of new avenues of research possibilities. So in the spirit of the decade, scientists funded by NASA and the Atomic Energy Commission decided to run experiments on prisoners. From 1963 to 1973, about 130 inmates at the Washington State Penitentiary and the Oregon State Penitentiary were subjected to extreme amounts of radiation. The scientists assured the prisoners that there was nothing to worry about. Plus, they would earn $25 for participating, and the scientists would even give a good word to the parole board. It may have sounded like a great gig, but those unlucky inmates had no idea what they were actually getting themselves into. Most of the prisoners were put in front of a powerful x-ray machine. Others put their testicles into a box of water, which was then zapped with radiation. These tests could last up to 10 minutes, during which time prisoners were bombarded with 400 rads of atomic power. For perspective, one rad is the equivalent of six normal chest x-rays, so just imagine 2,400 x-rays in a row. These lethal levels of radioactivity reportedly led to lesions, cysts, cancer, and possibly, in some cases, even death. Up until recently, syphilis was a bit of a mystery. While it's been around for hundreds of years, for a while, doctors weren't sure how to treat it, and most of the supposed cures were actually toxic. Hoping to understand the disease better, the United States Public Health Service decided to conduct an experiment, which ended up becoming one of the most infamous events in modern American history. In the early 1930s, the PHS teamed up with the Tuskegee Institute, a black college in Macon County, Alabama, to study syphilis among African American men. The plan was to observe patients for nine months and then tried to make them better, or at least that's what the PHS claimed. In reality, the plan was much more sinister. 600 black men took part in the Tuskegee experiment, 399 with syphilis and 201 without. They were lured in with the promise of free medical treatment for a variety of illnesses, but even after they were examined by doctors, none of the patients were told they had syphilis. They were also tricked into undergoing painful spinal taps. Then, in the 40s, scientists realized that penicillin was incredibly effective in treating syphilis, but the PHS never offered the antibiotic to the sick men. 
that would have ruined their experiment and prevented future observations. Thanks to the Tuskegee experiments, nearly 130 men died, and at least 40 patients passed the disease to their wives. 19 children were born with the illness, and research has demonstrated that thanks to the experiments, many African Americans are now distrustful of doctors and the American healthcare system overall. The PHS was exposed in 1972, and decades later, President Bill Clinton apologized on behalf of the nation. The PHS eventually paid $9 million to their victims. If you visit South Carolina or Alabama, you might spot a statue of 19th century Dr. J. Marion Sims. He's possibly one of the most important physicians in history. In 1855, he founded the first woman's hospital in America. He was the president of the American Medical Association, and he's also known as the father of modern gynecology. Back in the 1800s, women often suffered from devastating ailments known as fistulas, with one variety being called vestovaginal fistula, which tended to occur after a rough childbirth. In layman's terms, a fistula is a connection between two body parts that isn't supposed to be there. In this case, an opening between a woman's bladder and her vagina. This was painful, dangerous, and led to urinary incontinence. But this is no longer a problem in most countries thanks to Sims, as he figured out the best way to correct this problem. But the way he discovered this particular procedure is incredibly troubling. He needed to practice his surgical techniques on actual human beings, so he bought or rented slaves. He subjected 10 women to his experimental operations. They went under the knife without any anesthesia, as Sims believed that black women didn't feel pain. Sims would also invite other male physicians to watch the surgeries, and there were a lot of surgeries. He operated on one woman a total of 30 times. He eventually realized that silver sutures were the key to his procedure, but that discovery came at a terrible cost. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more grunge videos about creepy stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.